This video is brought to you by Wix, my choice for building Legal Eagle's website. I'm not a bad guy. I know that. When there's emotional testimony, I assume 85% of it is exaggeration. And the other 15? Perjury. Accurate. Hey Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer. Today we are covering The Social Network, which is a movie that I'm told is incredibly realistic. In fact, I'm told that some of the dialogue in this movie comes directly out of the deposition testimony that was taken in the various lawsuits that were filed against Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg. So this will be really interesting from my perspective because I've taken a lot of depositions and they have a kind of sound to them. So it'll be interesting to see if this movie gets it right. As always, be sure to comment in the form of an objection, which I'll either sustain or overrule, and stick around until the end of the video where I give the social network a grade for legal realism. So without further ado, let's dig in to the social network. So you were called in front of the ad board. That's not what happened. You weren't called in front of the administrative board. All right, so as expected, this movie deals a lot with depositions. What is a deposition? A deposition is an out of court cross-examination, essentially. Often people think about the only time you're under oath as being on the witness stand in trial. That's actually not true. Most of the testimony that takes place under oath takes place in a deposition. Uh, as you can see in this particular scene, there is a conference room, which is where most depositions take place. And on one side of the conference room table, you have the plaintiff and all of his attorneys. In a major case, you're likely to get two, three, four, sometimes five attorneys for each side. It's not uncommon to have the entire conference room packed with attorneys if the stakes are high enough. And on the other side of the table, you also have Mark Zuckerberg, in this case, the defendant with his attorneys. Uh, separating the two sides is the court reporter. Uh, you can see her in the middle here. She has her laptop open, but she is typing into a stenographer's keyboard, which is a phonetic keyboard that allows her to type very, very fast. What would have happened before this scene is the stenographer would have asked Mark Zuckerberg to raise his right hand and swear to tell the truth and to essentially put him under oath so that the testimony that he gives is sworn testimony. And if he lies under oath, then effectively he can be charged with perjury. A deposition is part of the discovery process. What you see on TV with a trial is only the tip of the iceberg. There are hundreds if not thousands of hours that go into any particular trial of discovery where you're trying to get the facts to support your case so that you're not blindsided at trial. And a deposition is one of the major tools that you have in order to get the testimony from the other side so you know what they're going to say. It is possible for someone to change their testimony at trial, but if you do, then you can quote impeach them with the testimony that they gave during their deposition. So what we're seeing here is a spot on representation of what a deposition looks like in a multi-million dollar case. So, so far so good. This is very accurate. She said all that, Mark, that I said that stuff to her. I was reading from the transcript of her deposition. Yeah, why would you even need to depose her? That's really for us to decide. You think if I know she can make me look like a jerk, I'll be more likely to Mark. settle. Yeah, so it is proper to take someone else's deposition testimony and ask another witness what they think about it. This is not an impeachment. She's not uh, contradicting Mark Zuckerberg's testimony here. She is simply providing the other testimony to get the witness's reaction to it. When you see a cross-examination on TV, it's often very, very heated, but the rules of a deposition are such that you can basically ask whatever question you want. The only thing you're really not allowed to ask in a deposition are questions that are protected by privilege, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. Why don't we stretch our legs for a minute? Can we do that? It's been almost three hours, and frankly, you did spend an awful lot of time embarrassing Mr. Zuckerberg with the girl's testimony from the bar. I'm not embarrassed, you just made a lot of that up. She was under oath. Then I guess that would be the first time somebody's lied under oath. So this may very well have been taken right out of the deposition transcript because it's often the case where an attorney will ask to take a break, whether it's for lunch or whether just to stretch your legs. That is exactly the kind of thing that a defense lawyer, a good one, will do so that you can have time to break up the flow of the questions for the plaintiff's attorney uh, and really just to take a break because it's very, very mentally taxing to be on the other end of a deposition. And the reason I say this might be taken right out of the deposition transcript is at no time did any of the lawyers say, okay, we're going to go off the record, which is a signal to the stenographer to stop taking down everything. And unless you tell the stenographer to stop typing, she will continue to take down everything that you say, including this sort of mundane colloquy between the defense attorney and the plaintiff's attorney over whether they're going to take a break or not. 
And then Mark Zuckerberg's uh, alleged kind of snippy dialogue where he's talking back to the plaintiff's attorney. All of that could very well be on the record because no one said to go off of the record, which is what you would normally say. So I think this is this could be very real testimony here. Cameron Winklevoss, W-I-N-K-L-E-V-O-S-S. -S. Cameron spelled the usual way. Tyler Winklevoss, Tyler spelled the usual way, and my last name is the same as my brother. Okay, here we have another deposition, this time uh, by the Winklevoss twins. It would be very, very unusual to have a deposition where you uh, question two people at once. That's probably more for a dramatic effect. I doubt that they took both of their depositions simultaneously. But if you go back to the uh, beginning of that scene, you get a really good view of what the stenographer is doing. She has uh, a special keyboard, it's hooked up to a laptop, and it writes everything down in special software. If you are an attorney, you can actually get a live readout of what's going on and often that becomes very very important to make sure that the exact words that you want especially when you're dealing with a contract case where the words matter uh, but to make sure that the exact words come out um, and are actually in the official record because if the stenographer didn't hear it that really doesn't exist anymore so the stenographer is very very important in terms of a deposition and as you can kind of see on the stenographer's laptop screen almost everything that you get out of a deposition is written in the font courier I have no idea why it's kind of hard to read and it looks really, really archaic, but like screenwriters and screenplays, almost everything you get out of a deposition is in this courier font. Who knew? That's what you said? It was three or four years ago. I don't know what I said. When did you come to Eduardo? I don't understand that question. Do you remember answering in the affirmative? The affirmative? When did you come to Eduardo with the idea for Facebook? It was called the Facebook then. This doesn't need to be that difficult. This is actually kind of a clever thing that they're doing in this movie. They're using Mark Zuckerberg's testimony in two different lawsuits, two depositions spaced probably months or years apart, and comparing his testimony between the two. And in fact, in the later deposition that takes place in the, the darker room, what he's doing is he's reading back Zuckerberg's testimony from the prior lawsuit. Often people's prior testimony will hurt them in other lawsuits because the testimony that they gave is good for a particular lawsuit, but it might be bad for a different lawsuit that hinges on other facts and law. What this shows is also a funny phenomenon that happens often in depositions where a witness has been overcoached, where the witness has been told you don't want to give in to questions even if they're easy answers. And what Zuckerberg has done here is he has refused to answer basically that he answered yes to a prior question that really isn't in dispute. If you want to see a great example of this, check out a video called What is a Photocopier put out by the New York Times, which is a dramatization of a deposition just like this one, where someone refuses to answer the question of what is a copy machine or what is a photocopier. When you say photocopying machine, what do you mean? They were essentially coached too well, and they refused to answer even the most simple mundane questions, and the lawyer just goes apoplectic. Do you have such a machine? Yes, sir. What do you call that machine? Sometimes it's really hard to get even very simple answers from a highly coached witness. It was a big project, and he was going to have to write tens of thousands of lines of code, so I wondered why he was coming to me and not his roommates, Dustin Moskowitz and Chris Hughes. They were programmers. This scene doesn't make a whole lot of sense because this appears to be the exact same scene of Zuckerberg's deposition. The plaintiff's lawyer is asking questions of Zuckerberg, but it doesn't make any sense for Eduardo Saverin to be testifying at exactly the same deposition as Mark Zuckerberg. What I think the filmmakers have done here is combine two different depositions. They're combining the deposition of Zuckerberg with the deposition of Saverin into the same thing, but you only get so many hours to depose the witness that you want to depose. So you would never take up that time by interviewing another witness on the same day at the same time, if this was a very crucial witness as the deposition of Mark Zuckerberg would be. So I think they just combine the two together. Uh, it would, it's not realistic that Saverin is testifying uh, essentially in the middle of Zuckerberg's testimony here. This is the first time he mentioned any problem. Yes, it was. You sent 36 emails to Mr. Zuckerberg and received 16 emails in return, and this was the first time he indicated he was not happy. That's correct. You had 42 days to study your system and get out ahead. Do you see any of your code on Facebook? I could Mark. You... Did I use any of your code? You stole our whole idea. Fellas. 
So it's possible that Zuckerberg may have interjected into this deposition of this other gentleman here. It's really, really bad practice because uh, you don't want your witness to chime in on someone else's witness's testimony here. But it appears that the lawyers are trying to get a handle on their two respective clients to try to prevent some interactions. So it's very possible that this is taken from a real deposition where Zuckerberg just became angry at what the deponent was saying and then was uh, forced to be quiet uh, by his own lawyer. I should note that it is totally proper for Zuckerberg to be present during the deposition of these other people. In fact, there's many reasons why you would wanna do that. Uh, if Zuckerberg is the one who has all the crucial information, he may need to provide that information to his attorney to know what questions to ask or to know where people are lying because you often only get one shot at these depositions and it can't wait for the testimony to be given back to your client, to get comments back and then get to ask questions later. That's not really how it works. So it often makes sense for the party to be there in person to give you real time notes. And at least with the federal rules of civil procedure, a named party can absolutely be present during the testimony of another witness like this. During the time when you say you had this idea, did you know Tyler and Cameron came from a family of means? A family of means? Did you know their father was wealthy? I'm not sure why you're asking me that. It's not important. You'd be sure why I'm asking. It's not important to you. Sigh. Yeah, so this might be taken directly out of deposition testimony here. The witness does not get to pick and choose what questions he or she answers, and whether or not Zuckerberg was aware of the wealth of the Winklevoss twins might be relevant to a further line of questioning. So you don't get to fight it just because you think it's irrelevant. You have to answer the questions that are given to you. I went to my friend for the money because that's who I wanted to be partners with. Eduardo was the president of the Harvard Investors Association and he was also my best friend. So uh, I should point out that in this deposition, it's very, very common in a multi-million dollar deposition to have it being video recorded. Part of the value of asking these questions that a witness is likely to say are irrelevant or just basically foundational is that you want the witness on camera fighting you tooth and nail because often in a deposition, the witnesses are not on their best behavior because they don't realize that their testimony might come back to haunt them. So often they're on their best behavior in trial in front of a jury and a judge, whereas in front of a camera, they forget it's there and they might be kind of jerks to the other side. And you might be able to use that to destroy their credibility later on, especially where someone refuses to answer a very simple question like, did you know someone came from wealth uh, in a situation like this? Eduardo, what happened after the initial launch? I'm sorry, Cy, would you mind addressing him as Mr. Saverin? Gretchen, they're best friends. Not anymore. Oh, we already went through this on the, Never mind, Mr. Saverin. That's a really funny interaction between the two attorneys. There's no rule that requires one attorney to refer to a witness as a specific thing or not, but often you might just interject that to break up their flow and to fluster them a little bit um, and get them speaking in your terms so that the record reflects things the way you want them reflected. And Mark was the biggest thing on a campus that included 19 Nobel laureates, 15 Pulitzer Prize winners, two future Olympians and a movie star. Who's the movie star? Doesn't matter. That does not sound like deposition testimony. That sounds like something written by Aaron Sorkin. You don't want any lunch? No. You're welcome to some salad. This is a really accurate scene so far. All the partners have gone to lunch. They're out of the office, uh, leaving one junior associate to basically play babysitter with the client to make sure that they don't do anything stupid. This must be hard. Who are you? I'm Marilyn Dopey. I introduced myself when we first... I mean, what do you do? I'm a second year associate at the firm. My boss wanted me to sit in on the deposition phase. Very accurate. The way that junior associates get experience is they get to sit in on depositions like this so they can see how it's done, so they can learn the tactics, and if the client can afford it, it's a great way for junior associates to gain experience. Well, as CFO, I had to set up some meetings with potential advertisers. Who paid for the trip? It was paid for at the $1,000 account I had set up a few months earlier. At this point, your $1,000 was the only money that had been put into the company? Yes. How did you feel the meetings went? They went terribly. Again, this doesn't make a lot of sense because 
Eduardo Saverin's lawyer is the one that's questioning Eduardo Saverin. Usually that doesn't happen. There's not much to be gained for creating testimony from your own client. The point of a deposition is to get adverse testimony from your opponent. So the plaintiff's lawyer is going to question Mark Zuckerberg and Mark Zuckerberg's attorney is going to question Eduardo Saverin. It's very rare to get deposition testimony out of your own client because you never know what kind of stupid things your client is going to say when you're not the one controlling that testimony. Instead, what you would want to do if you want to get testimony out to support a motion like a summary judgment motion is to file what's called an affidavit, which is a written declaration of what your client swears to. You can attach uh, exhibits to it. You can say whatever you want as long as it's truthful and, and the client has to sign off on it. So there's really no reason why you want to get verbal testimony from your own client when you can always get written testimony later on. I'm going to enter this into the record. Incorporation papers for Facebook and LLC registered in Florida. Why Florida? It's where my family lives. And ask the respondent to stipulate that the Articles of Incorporation state the ownership as follows. 65% for Mark Zuckerberg, 30% for Eduardo Saverin, and 5% for Dustin Moskowitz. Now we stipulate. And that was April 13th, 2004. You can mark it. So this is really, really accurate. When you're doing a deposition, you often deal with physical exhibits all the time. Emails, uh, articles of incorporation like this, any physical paperwork that needs to be talked about. First, you have to mark it as an exhibit to the deposition. You, of course, need to describe what you're going to be talking about and then put a number on it so that you can always refer back to, say, exhibit 35 is the articles of incorporation. So the dialogue that's going on right here is 100% accurate. Anytime you deal with a physical exhibit in a deposition, you've got to mark it, you've got to add it to the record, and then it's not entered into evidence per se, it's just an exhibit to that deposition. And often you'll refer back to that in other depositions or throughout that particular deposition. Eduardo. Can you please repeat the question? No, it was an outrageously leading question the first time around, and now you want us to hear it twice? Yes, would you read it back, please? Well, go ahead. Counsel, and when you signed these documents, were you aware that you were signing your own death certificate? No. That's a great tactic. So the sonographer, as I, I already talked about, is constantly taking down everything. And often the opposing attorney won't like the questions that you are asking. And one way to get around that just as a rhetorical device is to ask the stenographer to read back the question that you asked. And often, as what happens here, the witness actually just answers the question without you having to re-answer it and without the other attorney objecting to it. Here you could kind of hear that the opposing attorney was objecting to the question as misleading. It's not usually a proper objection. The, the rules of evidence don't really apply in a deposition, you're allowed to ask whatever questions you want. And often when I'm dealing with obstreperous opposing counsel, I'll do the exact same thing. I'll ignore the opposing counsel and just simply ask the court reporter to read back the question that I originally asked. And I will often get an answer to my question. I'm not a bad guy. I know that. When there's emotional testimony, I assume 85% of it is exaggeration. And the other 15? Perjury. Accurate. What happens now? Sai and the others are having a stake on University Avenue. Then I'll come back up to the office and start working on a settlement agreement to present to you. They're gonna settle? Oh yeah. And you're gonna have to pay a little extra. Why? So that these guys sign a non-disclosure agreement. They say one unflattering word about you in public, you own their wife and kids. I invented Facebook. Yeah, so there's some truth to that. I think that generally what happens after a deposition is not going straight to settlement. Really what's gonna happen is a motion for summary judgment, which is basically like a trial, but on paper. You take all of the depositions, you take all of the exhibits, you put them down on paper, you make your most convincing argument, and you say that even taking the evidence in the light most favorable to the other party that you're against, it still supports your side as a matter of law. In the grand scheme of things, the $500,000 that it takes to put together a summary judgment motion is nothing compared to the billions of dollars that are at stake and potentially at stake uh, in this uh, settlement agreement or the, the lawsuit in general. So most likely the next step would be summary judgment and only then would you go after settlement and if settlement failed, then you would go after trial. That's why 98% of cases settle first before going to trial because the stakes are too high and you never know which way a jury is going to go. 
I've been licensed to practice law for all of 20 months, and I could get a jury to believe that you planted the story about Eduardo and the chicken. Watch what else. Why weren't you at Sean's sorority party that night? You think I'm the one that called the police? Doesn't matter. I asked a question, now everybody's thinking about it. You've lost your jury in the first 10 minutes. Some truth to that. I was drunk and angry and stupid. And blogging. And blogging. Pay them. In the scheme of things, it's a speeding ticket. Yeah, for better or worse, that's often true. For a huge corporation, making these kind of settlements is uh, an easier thing to do than to roll the dice and go to trial where you might lose hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. <laughs> All right, that was The Social Network. Now let's give it a grade for legal realism. So much of this movie is told through depositions, and it appears that a lot of the dialogue was taken directly out of the deposition testimony. You can tell when there's back and forth between these lawyers, or they're asking for a lunch break, or they've been going for too long. That's exactly what a lawyer would say. And the dialogue is spot on, right down to marking an exhibit to go into the record. I don't know that I've ever seen a depiction of a deposition more accurate than what we saw here. On the other hand, I think that there is some cinematic license taken where they are conflating different depositions together. They're having the wrong attorney ask the questions here. The witness at one point was turned completely around and wasn't even looking at the camera. That would never be allowed. It's all for dramatic effect. But notwithstanding, this was one of, if not the most accurate legal drama I've ever seen in my entire life. I think largely because they used the deposition testimony as the reference material for the movie itself. So, with all of that under consideration, I'm giving The Social Network an A-. It's clear you did well at Harvard. It's a little known fact, but the character in the movie, Mark Zuckerberg, is actually based on a real person who went on to create one of the biggest websites in the world. You might even heard of it, thefacebook.com. Now, if you're going to be an internet billionaire, you first need to start with a stellar website. When I needed a website for helping law school students, I chose Wix. Wix helped me create an e-commerce store and a law school blog. I've used them for years and have paid for the websites with my own money, so I'm thrilled they're now a sponsor. I looked at other website builders, but they were too constricting. The templates were fine, but I couldn't change them how I wanted to. Wix allowed me to build an awesome professional website that let me be as creative as I wanted to be. The click and drag interface was incredibly easy to use, and it let me build exactly the website I wanted to help law students kick ass in law school. If you're looking to build your own website, you have to check out Wix. The first 100 Legal Eagles will get 10% off. Just click on the link below and use the code LegalEagle at checkout. So get out there and make the next Facebook with Wix.